Welcome back to the compound. This is Portfolio Rescue. I'm here with Duncan as we are each week. We get a lot of questions from people. A lot more tax questions this week, so we're going to break back on Bill Sweet. We have actually got a lot of follow up questions. Remember, our email here is askthecompoundshow at gmail.com. Today's show is sponsored by Liftoff, our automated investing platform powered by Betterment. Duncan, one of the cool things about Liftoff, I was looking at the asset allocation for my kids. When I started their accounts, it signed up. I said, go aggressive. And I think it gave me like 90-10 split. And, and I thought about this recently. I was looking at it. And I said, you know what? This doesn't make any sense. They need to be 100% in stocks. Let's make the change. One of the cool behavioral nudges that they have on there on their system is you go to make an allocation change. Before you do it, it says, wait, wait, wait. Let's think about this. What are the tax implications? Because this is a taxable account. I like how they just give you that little nudge. I'm not going to name any names. Some other platforms would like you to make those changes no matter what, right? They, right. they pop champagne bottles and confetti and every time you, you make a trade. Uh, Liftoff and Betterment are not like that. They, they want you to be thoughtful about making changes to your portfolio. So if you want to check it out, talk to one of our advisors, take a look, liftoffinvest.com. All right. Um, let's do it. First question. Okay. Well, diving right in. Uh, okay. So up I got, I got nothing. Yeah, I've been in. I was in Miami this week, and I, I, uh, I thought you were gonna have some jokes or something. You know, you came back from from Miami with nothing. My, my only the only joke on me is uh, there's a lot of money there. How's that? Seems um, like it. Yes. No. Did you? I, I hear everyone always says when you talk about Miami, everyone says something about like Brickle. So like, should I say like an obligatory like, oh, did you go to to Brickle? So that's like the the Brooklyn of of Miami. I, I guess. I have no idea. I've never been. I know. I mean, it, it makes me question my life decisions every time I go somewhere warm when I come back and there's snow on the ground and it's 14 degrees. But uh, this is there's trade-offs here. Yeah. One Miami, of these days, Miami's going to be wiped off the map by a hurricane. This is a trade-off you make. That's the give and take, right? Yeah. All right. Yeah. Let's do it. Okay. Uh, up first, uh, I've just come across your blog post from 2016 called Deconstructing 30-Year Stock Market Returns. Thank you for that. It was just a, exactly It was about exactly what I was looking for. Uh, and I wonder if you've updated your findings since then. Also, have you run the analysis for other time periods? 10-year and 20-year rolling averages would also be interesting. So if you're digging deep, going back in your library. Yeah, so Matthew McConaughey did his book tour a couple of years ago. Someone asked him about his writing process, and he said, I don't write to remember, I write to forget. And I guess it's kind of the way, so he's like, I, like, I want a journal, so I know how I'm feeling at any particular moment, and I can kind of go back and see where I was at that time. I guess I feel kind of the same way about blogging. I never thought I would compare myself to Matthew McConaughey, but here we are. All right, all right, all right. right? I'm not going to do it. Uh, so I've written a lot of blog posts, and I kind of forgot about this one. So I looked back at it. It was in 2016. John, pull up the blog post if you can. Uh, maybe we didn't have that. Uh, so I am happy to – so what I did at the time was I looked at the data on rolling 30-year annual returns for the stock market. Right? I, went, I have data going back to 1926 from our friends at Dimensional Fund Advisors and their Returns 2.0 database. And so I'm happy to update this one because it's been a while. 2016 was a while ago. So let's, I'm happy to do the 10 and 20-year numbers too, right? Because this is kind of my thing. I like looking at long-run data for the stock market, provide that context. So let's look at the 10-year numbers, John. So this is rolling 10-year returns, 1926 through January 2023. The best 10-year return of all time. These are you know using monthly returns. A little more than 21% per year for 10 years, ending in 1959. That's a total return of 600%, call it. Pretty good. Worst 10-year return, uh, the 10 years ending August 1939. The stock market was down 5% per year almost. That's a total return of a loss of about 40%. The 1930s were, were no joke, obviously. You still can see, though, even in the 10-year return number, a decade is a long time to invest. There's still a lot of variation in here, right, between really great and really poor numbers. Let's look at the 20-year returns, see if that does a little better. All right, 20-year returns. Now we're looking a little better because there's nothing in the red here. There has been no 20-year period in the U.S. stock market with losses. All right? Now, so these dates at the bottom are, are the ending dates, right? Best 20-year return, a little more than 18%. That was at the peak of the market in early 2000, right? So you had the 80s and starting in the early 1980s through March of 2000, 18% per year. Pretty good. Worst 20-year return, a little less than 2% per year. That's the 20 years ending in the summer of 1949. Makes sense because you're talking about the Great Depression and World War II. So if you have really poor returns, that seems like the time that would make sense. But again, no times where you had a 20-year period with a loss. That's pretty good. All right, last one, 30-year. This is one of my favorite all-time long-term charts. You can see the variation is compressed here. Best 30-year return, 
since 1926, almost 15% per year. It's the 30 years ending 1968, which kind of makes sense because it coincides the start of that period was when the worst 10-year return ended in 1939. So you go from the worst 10-year return to the best 30-year return. Not bad. Now, here's my, one of my favorite long-term stats about the market. Worst 30-year return of all time, 7.8% per year, starting in September 1929. So you top take the Great Depression. Johnny can do a chart off here. Duncan, that 7.8% per year over 30 years. Maybe I've shared this with you before. Wait, what is that's that in the a worst? The worst annual return. What's that on a total return basis over 30 years? So the worst total return you've ever experienced in the U.S. stock market over 30 years? I don't know. Pull it. All right. 850%, including dividends. Now, so that's the worst 30-year return you've ever returned. You got it. Obviously, I'm, usual caveats apply here. I didn't take taxes into account or fees or you know any of that stuff. Out of the way. But still, that's pretty darn good, right? I take the, that. I mean, you had to live for that time period. You had to live through the Great Depression and, and World War II and all this other bad stuff going on, deflation, all this stuff. The most recent 30-year return through January 2023, gain of 9.8% annually. 20-year 20, 20 return through then, 10.3%. 10 years was 12.7%. Pretty good numbers if you ask me, right? I don't know what long-term returns will be in the future. I don't know if, if – in a recent show, I argue, they, they could be lower. It, would, it, would, it wouldn't surprise me. But in that 2016 piece, I looked at – three non-overlapping 30-year periods. Because these are rolling, so some of them are going to have the same returns, right? So you think, what if we just broke them in and they're not overlapping at all? So I looked at like 1926 to 1955, 1956 to 1985, 1986 to 2015. And the res respective returns were like 10.7%, 9.6%, and 10% for those 30 returns, right? And all of these periods had really nasty stuff going on. So again, the 30s to the 50s had the Great Depression, Stock market crash of more than 80%, World War II, Korean War, four recessions. The next 30-year period had civil rights movement, the Vietnam War. One president was assassinated. One president was forced to resign. Oil price shock, double-digit inflation, huge interest rates, six recessions. Then that 86 to 2015 period had Black Monday, 1987, saving and loans crisis, Desert Storm, 9-11, Iraq, Afghanistan wars, great financial crisis, and three recessions. Right? You can point to really bad stuff in all those periods. Just think about what's transpired since then. Since I wrote this in 2016, we had an insurrection at the Capitol, a global pandemic, oil prices went below zero, inflation at 40-year highs, all that stuff. Returns have still been pretty good, right? So obviously we're not going to be promised anything going forward. I don't, I don't know what's going to happen in the future, but I don't, it's hard to look at these numbers and not be optimistic about the future. I think if you're betting against human progress, do so at your own peril. That's, that's my general take. Yeah, well said. And I think I like we're, we're all going to have, even if you're approaching retirement, we've talked about this in the past, you could still have a 20- or 30-year period ahead of you right as always i think the long run almost always wins undefeated and that's why that's why we wever up so much right <laughs> <No>. <laughs> just kidding just kidding definitely don't right. do that let's do another one okay uh up next we have a question oh wait from... hang on before we get to this. someone in the someone in the comments did you wanted miami take someone asked how many miami vices did ben have i think before we got in here i said I, three by the right. pool yeah right well, Best you, poolside drink you, there is. Can you drink one anywhere else? I mean, it pretty much has to be by a pool. You right? have to. You have to have sun, and you have to have. Yeah, it's the when in Rome thing. When in Miami, you have to do it. Like I can't go in like a cellar bar in Brooklyn and get a Miami. No, place, no, you know no. I mean? it, like, yeah, if you're ordering a drink from a guy with a mustache and, and like high waisted pants, then no, you can't order Miami right, vice. Right, and suspenders. Right. Yeah. Uh, next one. Okay. Uh, up next, we have a question from Will, uh, a young viewer, uh, a student. I love to see that. We love to see that we have students watching. Um, huge fan of the show. I'm a finance student at Michigan State, and I have a question about bonds. I know the bond market is on fire right now, and I'm wondering how to get in. Listening to your channel has truly paid dividends towards my education, and I recommend it to anyone trying to break into finance. That second part was immaterial, but I left it in because we like compliments. Yeah, we'll take it. Not to brag. Will, good for you for paying attention to this stuff when you're in college. I, uh, I'm not even sure I realized the stock market existed until I was maybe a senior in college, and I had to like, figure out what I want to do with my life. I couldn't have told you what a bond was. None of that. I was more interested in extracurriculars, which explains the Miami Vices. I have to say, this is the first time we've ever heard anyone clamoring to get into the bond market, right? And uh, I guess with interest rates much higher now and more interest in fixed income, I thought it would be a good idea, especially for someone like Will, but our regular listeners too. Like, let's do a good bond primer for everyone. I want to look at the different risks of investing in bonds. So first one is interest rate risk. So this one, one of those important things to understand about bonds Bond prices and interest rates are inversely related, right? When rates move up, 
bond prices go down. When rates fall, bond prices rise. This makes sense when you consider if you have a 5% bond that you're holding, Duncan, and rates go to 4%, your bond should be worth more. If rates go to 6%, your bond should be worth less. The other important factor to understand about interest rates is that bonds typically provide a good estimate. The, the starting yields typically provide a good estimate of your long-term return in bonds. John, do a chart on here of the five-year treasuries. This is the starting yield at the blue line. Orange line is your subsequent five-year annual return. Those are pretty close, right? The, the correlation between the starting yield and the ensuing five-year return is 0.92. So that's a strong to quite strong relationship. Now, it may seem obvious that a five-year bond would have a yield that starting yield matches its five-year return, but this works for other maturities who have done this for five years, seven year, 10 year, pick a, pick a return over the long term, your starting yield and bonds, less some sort of default slash credit risk, which we're going to get into, and that's kind of where you end up. So duration risk is probably the next thing. So duration is a good proxy for how sensitive your bonds are to changes in rates. It's a number that it's expressed in years because it basically tells you how long it'll take to get your whole money back, right? Principal plus the, the yield. So it's a little less than the maturity. The good rule of thumb here is the longer your maturity, the higher your duration, and thus the more volatility you experience to changes in rates. So the other rule of thumb is the decent approximation is your duration will tell you how much your bond will move relative to a 1% move in interest rate. So let's say you have a bond with a duration of three and a half years. If rates go up 1%, you should expect your bond to drop three and a half percent. If rates go down 1%, you should expect your bond to gain 3.5%, right? Those numbers aren't precise because there's this thing called convexity where bonds tend to lose less money than they gain. Oh yes, but convexity. Pretty yeah, close sorry, close enough. The other one is is we talk a lot about government bonds. We won't even get into convexity, Duncan. It's it's not worth it. <laughs> uh credit risk is the other one. So if you have corporate bonds or mortgage bonds or asset backed bonds, you could have a downgrade. And why do bonds drop on a credit downgrade? Most likely it's because a lot of times they're just sold. Like institutional buyers or ETFs or mutual funds can't hold them anymore because of their investment mandate. So if you had a corporate bond that went from a high credit rating that was quality credit to high yield, a lot of ETFs and institutional investors probably can't hold those anymore if they have a mandate that they can't hold high yield bonds. So default risk is the next one. That's just, uh, so the long-term default risk for a high yield bond, junk bond is like three to 4%. So you, you can't really take your yield and high yield and say, I'm gonna get that going forward. You have to kind of lop off some for default. Obviously that number is different depending on the economic environment that we're in, but you should take that number to account when having those expectations. Finally, the last one is inflation risk. This is the biggie. So I looked at the numbers before for long-term bonds. This is just to illustrate a point here. From 1946 to 1980, long-term government bonds in the U.S. returned about 2% per year nominally, right? Not bad considering rates went from like 2% to 15% in this time frame, right? So people really worry about interest rates rising. That wasn't really that big of a deal. But inflation was almost 4.5% over this period. So that means you lag bigly on a real basis. How bad? Duncan, I'm not going to make you guess again. On an inflation-adjusted basis, long-term bonds were down 60% from 1946 to 1980. You just got crushed by inflation. This is an extreme example, but it goes to show you that, again, rising rates aren't as big of a deal for investors as, as high inflation or rising inflation. Because rising rates, eventually, you pick up those higher yields, and that'll, that'll kind of help you a little bit. That's what's happening now. You had a really bad year, but now rates are higher, so investors are in a better place for bonds. So... Listen, as a young person in college, I'm not sure you really need to worry about missing out on the bond market by any means. Bonds are still far more boring than the stock market. And I mean, at least you can earn some higher yield. But if I was a young person, I'd be far more concerned with the stock market because bonds can help with short term immediate term goals. But the stock market is still your best bet against hedging inflation. So I'd, I'd still pay more attention to the stock market if I'm a young person. If you want to understand the bond market more, sure, learn about it a little bit. But that was uh, Ben's primer on bonds. How'd I do? That was good. I'm I'm not gonna lie, but you you still lost me a little bit there. Bonds bonds are one of the most confusing topics to me in, in finance. What's the confusing as a part to you? Person. Tell me the confusing part. To Just you. like when you're when you're saying the if uh, if rates go up by this much, then it means that you're gonna go down by the percent. Like I just that it loses me as soon as I start hearing about that. Okay, just think of so if your duration is ten and rates go up one percent, one percent is like the key here, right? Mm -hmm. If if rates go up one percent, you're gonna go down ten percent if your duration is ten. If rates go down 1%, you're going to go up 10%. Now, if rates go down 50 basis points, you're going to go up 5%. If rates go up okay. 50 basis points, you're going to go down. See, that's the relationship kind of. It's not, and it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but it's pretty darn close. I got it. So, so the longer your maturity, that makes sense that you would have more volatility to changes in rates because there's so much more that can happen in that time frame. Rates can change more. Inflation can change more. Economic growth can change more. And so it makes sense that shorter-term bonds have a lower duration than longer-term bonds.
Right, right. All right. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. So I'm familiar Oldie, with, uh, Oldie has a duration of like 974, give or take. Yeah, sure. Yeah. It's looking good year to date. I think still, right. maybe. Yeah. Let's do it. Let's do yeah. another question. Okay. Up next, we have a question from Dave. Have any of the Riholz tax bills, and for those of you that are listening and are new to the show, um, these are people bills, not not tax bills. But uh, have any of the Riholz tax bills encountered an online calculator for determining the RMDs registered or required minimum distribution rate uh, for it. a non-spousal IRA beneficiary, so-called inherited IRAs? I'd like to. Uh, I'd sure like ask, uh, access to one. It would help, I think, if the IRS updated Notice 2022-53 in the form of a proposed, or better yet, a financial, uh, a final regulation, so that taxpayers know if uh, they will have a penalty tax if they don't take an RMD in 2023. All right, wow, this is from Dave. <laughs> this is yeah, Dave went deep here. Uh, we're going to bring him over our tax bills. We have a high concentration to bills in our tax department. Here's Mr. Bill Sweet. Bill, a lot of jargon going on here. Yeah. Uh, I don't, I don't know where I don't know where you want to start. Dave Dave is locked in here. Uh, yeah. Uh, the IRS regulation notice uh, was <laughs> uh, that's a first. So way to go, Dave. Yeah. And uh, Dave is in the chat right now. I think goes right to the tax code. It's yeah. beautiful. So 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 what do we what do we uh, help me sort out this mess here? What's going on here? Yeah. So I came in late uh, to the back show because I was working on some ribs, Duncan. I grew these from a pig, and they are oh delicious. I gotta, I gotta tell you that. But John said, "Bill, your light's coming in hot." Uh, but it's not because Dave is coming in hot, citing IRS notices here. That was beautiful. The backstory here: the IRS changed the rules on us, right? Really, Congress did. Excuse me. The old rules, Ben, used to be what you needed to take an IRA distribution within five years for an inherited IRA, right? If you inherit your uncle, your dad's IRA. But the old rule also allowed you to do what over your lifetime? Do you remember the the good old days? Nothing. All right, stretch IRAs. So stretch IRAs. <laughs> stretch. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember the stretch right, IRA right. like stretch, stretch Armstrong? Armstrong. Right, right. Okay. Yeah, cool. 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 So what Dave's referring to is the IRS when they when we they rolled out crickets. We needed a crickets <laughs> thing there. Dave knew what I was talking about when the IRS <laughs> uh, rolled out the Secure Act. <clears throat> they moved the RMD age up, which was great. But then they said, "Look, there's no more RMDs for inherited IRAs, but you need to take them all within 10 years." Right. And so now there's this 10 year window for anybody who inherits an IRA after 2020. And that includes this year. There was a gigantic freak out from the people. They were like, what about the kids? And what about this? The IRS came out. They changed the rules again, allowed uh, eligible de de uh, designated beneficiaries. And then last year. So but but still for the 10 years, they said no RMDs required. Don't worry about it, guys. Everybody's cool. Um, but then last year, the IRS said, guess what? We researched the tax law a little bit more, and there are actually RMDs due for these 10-year RMDs, inherited IRAs, for a certain class of folks, for somebody who died uh, after they started their RMD during their lifetime. What am I, like, this is a giant confusing mess. It's kind of crazy that they're able, that they don't just grandfather people into the old rules and Golly. say the new rules are going to start in five years or something that. Yeah. Well, I guess they did, because if you inherited an IRA three years ago, you, you still are playing by the old rules. But what Dave's getting at, this is a mess. And his question is, how do I sort this out? Uh, I would go to a trusted custodian. I, I think that ultimately is the place to go. We custody Bennett at Schwab, at TD, at Fidelity. The, these are trusted third parties. They're the best in the business. I find Schwab's calculator to be very, very useful. We don't need to do a segment here on the differences of the rules, but basically they ask you a bunch of questions about your age, how old is the person you inherited the IRA from, when do they die, what type of IRA it is. You spit that all out and it'll tell you, here's your RMD for, for this year. This is what, what you should do, or there's no RMD required until until year 10. I find Schwab's calculator to be roughly the best, and I would encourage anybody else to, to check it out and use it. Once again, we have job security for you because it's it's a mess, right? Yeah, it's, people trying to understand this stuff. Like I've said before, people hate paying taxes more than they like making money, Ben. And right. I think ultimately, if, if, if you understand nothing about what I just said and you're dealing with an inherited IRA, th th you're right. This is a perfect advertisement, Dave, for the services of a certified financial planner. Ritholtz Wealth are among them. Just make sure they're an investment fiduciary. They're not a life insurance salesman, and they're trying to help you solve this problem. I don't know. Dave, Dave knows the IRS tax codes. So maybe he's going to find it on the calculator and do it himself. Uh, can I comment, though, on his last part, which is, you know, why haven't they finalized this? <laughs> like, it, it is insane. And this, unfortunately, is the world we live in of, like, below competence all of a sudden. But, yes, just putting an IRS notice out saying, hey, you actually might be subject to RMDs. Sorry we didn't tell you for two years. 
you probably need to do something for the end of the year and not even making that guidance final. Uh, I think this is a problem of governance and I'm, I'm with Dave. It, it, it's a mess and, and God, God save us all. Duncan, right. what was harder to understand this one or the bond stuff? Uh, this one. <laughs> yeah. I hope so. I mean, they both involve a lot of convexity, you know. But, Con yeah. Convexity, and yeah. maybe I should show up to the meeting on time, right? So I'd, I'd be better prepared. But Dave, good luck to you. Send us an email if we can give you a hand. All right, yeah, next thanks, one. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yep. Dave's always, always in the question. chat and uh, always writing in good questions. So I'm glad Big we, ups we to Dave. To use one, so. uh, okay, so up next, and I made my screen larger, so now I can actually read, so I won't stumble over this one as much, hopefully. <laughs> um, all right, uh, this question is from Sam. Do you think a backdoor Roth IRA is worth it? Assume that other tax advantage vehicles are maxed out and no traditional IRAs, so not concerned about the pro rata rule. No idea what that means. Uh, I think if everything is maxed out and a higher earner wants to save more, options are backdoor Roth or brokerage account. Personally, I feel like buying index ETFs in a brokerage account would be way easier, but not sure how to quantify the benefit of a backdoor Roth. So your favorite topic here, backdoor Roth. Bill does like Roth IRAs. I, I'm kind of with Sam here on a lot of stuff is my first question is always, is it worth it? Is it worth the hassle and the paperwork? And even if I could like make 25 basis points more per year over the long term, is it just easier for me to, to just take the easier out and, and stick it in index funds and a taxable account and call it a day? Bill, what say you? It's a great question. Uh, Sam, a very strong name. I named my firstborn son Sam, so I'm a, a big, big fan. Uh, my question for Sam is, do you like tax-free distributions? Like, is that something that would appeal to you? And I think the, the, the thought process is if you have $6,500 to invest, and that's what we're talking about here, that, that's the, 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 the IRA contribution limit for this year, would you rather get that back after it's grown? Rule of seven, right? $6,000 grows to $12,000 over 10 years, $24,000 over 20 years, $48,000 over 30 years, right? I mean, we're not talking about small bits of money if we're dealing with a 30-year, 40-year timeline. Do you want all of that investment gain, that $40,000 of gain to come to you tax-free? Or do you want to pay tax on it? And that, that's, that's the question. Is it worth it or not? So to quantify it, it's probably worth about $8,400 of tax. And so again, that is more than your initial contribution, assuming that you get a 7%, 7 8% return over the next 30 years. Do I think it's worth it? I, I think so. Uh, but like everything else, there's pros and cons. Uh, one of my famous charts here, there are it pros and cons. I know, Duncan's there to spit his water out all over. He's, get here late every time. Um, ultimately, there are pros and cons, right? So do you like tax-free distributions? We just talked about that. The cons of a taxable brokerage account are tax, tax, and tax. Tax number one, you have to pay tax every time a dividend hits that, that account, right? And Ben, where are yields today versus where they were two, three years ago, right? I mean, they're not we're nothing. We're talk, probably talking, yeah, 2% dividends, maybe a little less. Yeah, okay, for dividends, but maybe you have a balance of you know fixed income, like a, you can get 4%, maybe 5% from a short-term treasury right now. Ultimately, you're going to give back about a third of that to taxes right along the way, and that, that decreases the compounding effect of your gains. Second tax, like I discussed, about $8,000, assuming you wait for 30 years, you're going to pay about eight grand in income tax from a brokerage account versus nothing from a tax-free Roth IRA distribution. And finally, that like the, there's, there's the tax on rebalancing, and that's a significant effect. If I move from a 60-40 to a 40-60 or whatever it is in an IRA, nothing happens tax-wise. It's only in the distribution that gets taxed. If I have a brokerage asset, man, if I don't pick my mutual fund wisely, if I want to move from mutual funds or ETFs, I need to eat that tax along the way with a brokerage account. So my question to you, Sam, do you want to pay tax on the gains or don't you? And the trade-off there is flexibility, right? For a Roth IRA, you really can't mess with it until you're 59 and a half. That's so the point. If we, if we brought, if we did the cage match between you and Nick Majuli, Nick has said, he's made the argument before that you shouldn't max out your 401k because a brokerage account gives you more flexibility if you're going to buy and hold a low-cost index fund. If, and, that's and if, if it's a key question. And if yes. you don't rebalance along the way, and if you don't like tax-free distributions, I don't think it's an either or. I, I think it's a how much, right? And, and ultimately right. what you want to have in your 60s and your 70s or 80s is diversification. You want tax diversification. Yeah. And, if, and if this person is already maxing vehicles. out retirement vehicles, they obviously like they like to have tax deferred accounts, right? So that they, you'd think it would maybe would make sense for them. Yep. Do you think, Ex exactly. do, people, do people like have a little party when they turn 59 and a half because they can access this? <laughs> I mean, this? I did this is funny. Dad. It seems like my, it my, ki my children who are eight years and younger they still like to like kind of like celebrate their half birthday. Like, hey, I'm mm. five and a half now. Uh, so the only other time you do that is when you turn 59 and a half, I guess. Yeah, it's a, it's a big deal, Duncan. Yeah, you get the, you get the penalty and you get tax-free Roth distributions. Why wouldn't you want that, Sam? I, I say go for it.
It's like All when right. a young person talks about their like six month anniversary or something, you know, and you're like, oh, that's They're dating. You sweet. know, those yeah. cute little couples you're Call dating. Call me in 10 years. Yeah. 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 All right. Exactly. Last All right. question. Last but not least, we have a question from Eric. I really like this question a lot, and I'm curious to hear the answer. I just want to let Bill know we've we received multiple questions on this. This was the best moment. We've seen a lot of okay. questions on this. Let's do it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, Eric writes. I have two follow-up questions regarding the Roth 401k employer match topic you discussed a few weeks ago. How do taxes work on this portion? Say your employer matched 5% of your salary of $100,000. Would that mean that you end up with $5,000 in your 401k as a Roth amount? Or would that $5,000 be subject to income tax and leave you with less? Number two, uh, do do you need to contribute to your 401k as a Roth contribution in order to have your employer match be Roth? Okay, so just a reminder, we talked about this a few weeks ago with Bill. That, that now you have the ability to not only have a Roth 401k, but get your company match in that 401k in the form of a Roth. I didn't know you. I didn't know how that this worked before. That if you had a Roth 401k, you'd put your money in the Roth, but then your match from the company would be in a traditional 401k. Now this mm-hmm. year it's changed, right? So, right. all right, Bill, I never, I didn't think about the tax implications on me. Explain yeah. to me how this works. Yeah, and mea culpa on my side, I made a mistake on the last program. I was thinking in my head about FICA uh, for income tax. A 5% matching Roth IRA contribution is going to be taxable income in the year that you receive it, right? That that gets dumped into your account. But again, one last famous chart, so Duncan spews. The question is, do you want to pay tax now or do you want to pay tax later, right? And so that it's Bill's, the same dynamic. The, the addition to Bill's Roth IRA tattoo on the back is going to say, it's like a dragon tail. It's going to be like, do you like tax-free <laughs> distributions? <laughs> yeah. Well, that is, that is the question. So, yeah. So then that matching contribution, it is taxed when you received. What it does not get taxed, though, uh, is on FICA. You do not have to pay employment taxes, employment taxes on the matching contribution to a Roth 401k or a traditional 401k. So that was a mistake I made last time. No, yes, there is income tax on the contribution. There is no FICA. And so that that creates a level playing field. And again, the, the, the question is, where's my tax rate going to be now versus where's my tax rate going to be in distribution? It's different for everybody. I think while young, uh, matching Roth contribution sounds absolutely peachy. So this is, this is essentially like a kind of like a backdoor Roth that you're doing in yeah. your 401k, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. And so their second question was, um, <clears throat> here, where is it? I forget. Oh yeah, do you, need to, do you need to contribute on a Roth in order to get the matching Roth? God's honest answer is I, we don't know. Um, the, the also, role, you contribute to a traditional, but then your match is in a Roth. Correct, can you mix and match? Can you flip the That's switch? That's what I would want. Yeah, I mean, it sounds super cool, right? Um, Best the, of both worlds. The honest answer is we don't know. And the reason that we don't know is the, the law just changed in December, right, for this year. It said immediately on passing the law, December 27th, custodians, most custodians haven't rolled out the program on how to actually handle this. There's no IRS guidance that I'm aware of. Our custodian has not updated our plan, and I don't believe that Fidelity or anyone else has. So ultimately, this is something, these are answers that are coming. I would direct that question to your custodian, and it's very possible that they might interpret the rules a little bit differently uh, than another plan. Um, but, but again, I, I think it's, I think that, I think it's awesome to have different choices. Ultimately Congress wins because they're paying, they're getting the taxable income now. Right. And we have a massive budget hole. So why wouldn't you want to tax it income now? And you as an investor, you can pick and choose based on your situation. And again, I think for, for young people with a long time period to compound, it, it's very difficult. That is, think, that's a good point about Congress getting the tax hours now. Cause I, I see people yeah. a lot of times over the years have asked me like, don't you think eventually they're going to come after Roths and like, try, but like, no, the tax has already been paid. Yeah. Right. They already yeah, got they it already up got front. It. They got a down payment. Well, but what if they could tax it again? It, yeah. Right. So it is, it is very possible, but I, I think it's rational just to plan on the tax code more or less staying the same. Right. Not not to get too. Yeah. It'd be, it'd be catastrophic if if uh, Canada invaded and took over the U.S. and said no more taxes at all. Like we're great. Like you can go to these hypothetical rules. The trade off there is we get more exist. Tim Hortons, though. And and maple syrup, uh, Molson's yeah, is get a ham, fantastic ham beer. sandwiches with donuts. Fiend demand, uh, just a, a classic. But back to Roth, I just think the more dollars you can cram into long-term compounding tax-free money, why would you not take that option uh, early in your career and then switch that later on as you make more and more money in your career? Bill, you sold me. Great. I think I, I did I have, two years I'm ago. Yeah. I have one follow-up for, for our Capitol Hill audience watching. What's your pitch? What would you ask them to, to do to, to make all this easier? Oh, we talked about it on the last show. TSP, open this thing to the masses. Like, why yes. are 401ks tied to employers? I don't want my employer making my investment decisions Give for me. Give us one one limit. Make it sixty grand or whatever you're going to make it. It yep. includes HSAs. It includes 529s. It includes 401k. Yep. Put it all in the same bucket. 
Make it easy. I kind of yeah, like. I actually kind of like having Bill Sweet make my <laughs> investment decisions for me. Though, but, yeah. uh, Flattery will get you everywhere. But yeah, TSP for the masses. The program exists. It's fantastic. And why not just make those contributions to payroll the same way you pay your payroll tax? Like you don't have to think about it, right? Wouldn't that be awesome? Perfect. I, I think Bill's other job security here on this show is. We get an endless amount of Roth IRA questions every week. Honestly, taxes are taking over our inbox just with just along with bonds. Keep them coming. People hate taxes. Duncan, I got a question from the stream here. People want to know, is the, is the Fed shirt coming back? I got my uh, Fed Godfather shirt. People um, want to know if it's coming back to the store. Maybe maybe if there's enough demand. I think I think Josh said that we might bring it back when they cut. Um, but, but if you want to see okay. it before then, let us know. Okay. Uh, quick announcement here. No show next week. I'll be out of town because apparently spring break is not enough. Our kids now have to have a winter break or a mid winter break. Here. Yeah. So we're going Send them somewhere. to school. I know. So we're going somewhere. I know. They get Coddling of the off. American mind. Oh, get them to work. <laughs> leave us a review. Leave us a question. Thank you to everyone for tuning in live. Remember, uh, YouTube, you can leave us a comment or a question. Email us, ask the compound show at gmail.com. And we will see you next time. See you everyone. Roth IRA for life. <laughs>